So our guest speaker, of course, is Marshall Terrell. And he is one of four children and an Air Force brat. He lived multiple states, mainly in Northern Virginia. As he was growing up, he loved reading Sports Illustrated, Rolling Stone and People magazine. After high school, he moved to Phoenix, Arizona. While studying business in 1984, he worked for Charles Keating. Five years later, Keating's company, Lincoln Savings and Loan, was the target of a federal investigation. Keating was sent to jail and Marshall was suddenly unemployed. At age 26, he moved back into his parents' home and began his second career as a biographer. His first subject, his hero, actor Steve McQueen. For the next three and a half years, he researched the life of McQueen. In December of 1993, the 564 page book, Steve McQueen, Portrait of an American Rebel was released. He is certainly one of the most prolific writers I've ever heard of and certainly know. He's written 31 books, including four on Steve McQueen, Elvis, Johnny Cash, and Billy Graham. Coming out later in, well, June of 2023, Fame with Greg Laurie, one of his frequent co-authors, and it's their take on modern day fame. And I certainly hope he'll say something about that. Soon after, another one we'll all want is Elvis and the Colonel with Greg McDonald, Colonel Parkner's protege. It promises to be a gentler look at Colonel Parker. In 2024, and these are just a few items of all the, the projects he's working on, two books are going to come out. One is a book on serial killer Charles Schmid. I'm not quite sure how that was researched, but that will be great. And then how Marshall stepped in my life. Through an introduction from my guest, you will meet soon, Anthony D. Maria. The second release is a book about a man who, on August the 8th, 1969, kissed me on the cheek and said, Patricia, you are doing terrific haircuts. Then he went next door to the booth where my best friend Frankie Costa worked and he said Frankie will you look after my mug until I come back on Monday my boss who I often talk about Anthony's uncle the subject of Anthony's film cutting to the truth and Marshall's book, An Eye for Style, The Life and Death of Jay Sebring, American Icon. When Jay Sebring left our salon on Friday, August the 8th in 1969, he flew to Los Angeles where he and his good friend Sharon Tate were murdered by the Manson family. Marshall's presentation will be a conversation. I will ask him the questions no doubt you want the answers to, and certainly you can ask about the celebrities you know and love and any other subject we do not cover. And make sure I, rem I remember to ask Marshall to show us some of what he has on the wall in his office. So will you please, with me, welcome our guest, Marshall Terrell, and thank you, thank you, thank you, jazz hands and applause, yay. Welcome, Marshall. I hope you feel the love, and Anthony will be with us a little later. I do feel the love, thank you. Good, well, 
all these books, such a life. When did you decide you wanted to become a writer? Well, as you mentioned, I was working for Charles Keating. I was married at the time. And so when the whole Keating thing went down, my wife left me. And so my dad lived in Washington, D.C. at the time. And as you explained, he was a, a colonel in the Air Force. And he was a loving, loving, great guy. But, you know, he also had a tough demeanor to him. So he called me on the phone and said, uh, all right, so you lost your job and your wife left you. What's your next trick going to be, kid? And I said, well, actually, I do have a trick up my sleeve. I said, I want to move back with you and I want to write a book. And then he said, you never even wrote a paper in high school. Why would you want to write a book now? And I just said, I don't know why. I just feel compelled to do it. And these were the words of wisdom that he gave me. And he said, well, he thought about it for a second. He said, well, you know what? I was 26 at the time. And he said, you know what? You're young enough to where if you do this and you fail, you can always go back and get a job. And so that's what gave me the courage to, to start writing. Um, and of course, at the time, there was no internet. So the Library of Congress was where the largest collection of material was at the time. So there, I was strategic in wanting to move back with them. So that's how my career started. And you've written 31 books, have plenty more coming out. And your first was on Steve McQueen. So why Steve for your first one? Well, he was my idol growing up. Um, my dad, I would say my dad was my hero, but Steve McQueen and John Lennon were my idols. Um, and so was Roger Staubach, the quarterback, and Pistol Pete Maravich, the basketball player. So those were my four idols growing up. Uh, and I've written about every one of them except John Lennon, who was my biggest idol. Um, anyway, um, I, um, I I decided to write about Steve because because my dad was the McQueen fan in our family uh, because it, it you know he was a little he was a little bit older than than I was so I didn't see his movies in the '60s with the exception of I saw a double bill when I was five years old a Bonnie and Clyde and Bullet. <laughs> Can you imagine a five-year-old kid? Wow. Yeah. So when, when Bonnie and Clyde were getting all shot up, I looked at my cousin and said, what, what's going on here? Anyway. Um, uh, so Steve McQueen was just compelling. He was always out in the movies on television all the time. His movies were getting shuffled to television. And so I just, there was something so likable about him that I just, and I just immediately gravitated to him. And um, I, I, you know, it's one of those things you just can't explain other than my dad loved him. Um, when a McQueen movie came out, he'd pull me out of school and we'd go and see the movie together. So that's always just a fond memory. And then later on, as I wrote about McQueen and I traveled around the world and collected stories about McQueen, I'd heard that the, the father son thing and, be, and being passed on uh, to, to the next generation was definitely a thing, sort of like Elvis Presley getting passed down through the generations. So um that, that kind of explains my uh, fascination and love for McQueen in a nutshell. Uh, how do you go about your research? And surely not all your books take three and a half years. No, and that's the thing. It, it, now it's it's quicker because of the internet. You know, if back in the old days, you, it, it was what I called, uh, you had to gumshoe it. You know, you had to actually go places. You had to go to the libraries. You had to go see people. Um, and nowadays with Zoom and, and, you know, libraries being on the Internet, you have access to those materials much quicker and you can write much faster. So but I will say this, the Pete Maravich book that I wrote uh, took seven years to write because that was still in that transitional phase where uh, Internet was in its infancy. And then we conducted 300 interviews. It took me two years to transcribe tapes by my hands. So um, but those days are over. Yeah, life is definitely easier. Now, I know you collaborate on many of your books. How do you pick co-authors? How does that work? Well, it's kind of like the, the John Lennon, Paul McCartney method. John Lennon selected Paul McCartney because um, he was going to be better. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, you know, he, he said, well, you know, I could be the star of the show or the band could be better. And so he selected Paul McCartney for that reason. That's the reason why I select my my collaborators and that it's going to make the project better. So it's, it's really that simple. But you don't always know who you're going to get when you collaborate with and, and how easy or hard that's going to be. And in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, it you 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 end up finishing the book, but you don't always become that you don't always stay that person's friend or you, you stay friends. Say, well, 
I'll never do a book with that person again. And now Susan Rowan would want me to ask you, are you willing to tell us who the biggest pain in the ass was? Oh, absolutely. I can't say his name because I wrote a uh, non-disclosure, but I, I can say that uh, he was a uh, big singer in the early 90s who has a very famous daughter. And, um, I, you know, I unfortunately got him in a bad time in his life. And he was very paranoid. Um, and when I went into his house, all the lights were dim and he'd be wearing sunglasses and he never sit still. And so I'd be sitting at this table trying to interview him and he'd pace back and forth like this. And I'd say, now, hold on a second. The tape recorder's not going to pick you up. So would you please just sit down? And he'd say, never mind that. Let me just tell you the story. And um, he, he, um, he was just, uh, he was very, very hard to get along with, had a big ego, very little talent, but somehow um, maintained his uh, fame. And, um, you know, one day uh, we, I just decided this is just too painful. And so we, we, we just decided to get the attorneys involved and part, uh, it wasn't so amicably, but we parted. And uh, I get, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, do, do they usually reach out to you or do you reach out to them? It's a matter, it, it goes both ways. Um, sometimes publishers look for uh, uh, writers to match with the, and then sometimes they come directly to me. Sometimes I reach out to them. Um, I re recently reached out to a very famous English actor who is one of my favorites. And um, I've been having this ongoing dialogue with him for now for about three years. And he keeps saying, yes, yes, I'm going to do that book. But uh, I've just got this other movie to do. And I understand it because, you know, he gets paid millions of dollars to do films, whereas with a book, it would be thousands. So it makes sense. But on the other hand, at one some point in time, you want to leave, leave a legacy behind to your children. Because I always tell people, you know, don't let your stories die with you because that's what happens. My, my dad died in the uh, pandemic. He was one of, the, one of the first people to die. He was 83. And then um, four weeks before he died, I took him on a road trip to his hometown. And I said, Dad, I want to just get all your stories growing up. And so I was able to uh, tape record them. And I've still got those stories. And one day I'll develop that into a book. Um, and so I was happy I mean, and happy to, to be able to do that. But a lot of people, unfortunately, don't. Uh, and it's funny what kids today think is history. I just interviewed a young lady. Um, it was a time capsule. And I said, what did you put in there? And she said, oh, I put I put in this meme from uh, a long time ago. And it turned out a long time ago was 2018. So <laughs> can you imagine what their sense of history is like? <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, my, my uh, brother and I said to my dad one day, we had a tape recorder, hey, dad, tell us some of those funny stories you've always told us about the, the characters in, your, in our town when you were a little boy. And we were so interested. My father sat down and wrote his memoirs. And he, I was in America. He read every night to my mother and brother what he wrote. And then they, uh, at page 87, they said, you know, Trish would like to hear this. So we went back and recorded them again. But it is a joy. Now, what what part do editors play for you? Well, they play a big part. Um, I always say that editors are. You, you ever noticed uh, lead lead singers always hang out with their lead guitarist, and that's because they want them around um, because they help mm -hmm. shape the sound. Editors are the same same way. The way I I look at it, and I have two editors. I have one that's a developmental editor where I'm just trying to brainstorm, come up with an opening. She'll help me do that. Um, and then at the end, uh, so she'll she'll edit throughout the book and then I want another set of eyes on it. So then I hire a line editor just to give it a little polish. And then by the time that the editor from the publisher gets it, it's, it's near perfect. And of course they have to put that little touch on it too so that they feel like they do something. But I always pay a little bit extra uh, because that, that way you also develop a good reputation in the publishing business. Oh, you know, he, he, he turns in clean copy. Yeah, and, and because today publishers don't have the time to uh, do those edits for they expect it to be good. 
Good. Now, you've written books about many famous people, Steve McQueen, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Billy Graham. And let's not forget your 2022 book on Lennon, Dylan, Alice and Jesus. So I know my pals and we always love hearing stories. So perhaps in the chat, some of our friends might put names of people they want a story about, in which case, Tony, I don't look at the chat, you are going to have to tell me, but begin with, can we begin with what's your favorite story about Elvis? And what will surprise us about your your book on Colonel Parker that we can read next year? Okay. Favorite story about Elvis is in the 1950s, I think in 58, when he was in the army, he took a two week excursion to Paris. And um, he and his boys um, went to go see a show at the Lido, which was, I guess, a very famous uh, club with showgirls. So at the end of one night, they brought back like the whole chorus line and they all stayed the night. And so the next night, um, well, the next day, the next morning, they, the owners of the club called over at the house and said, uh, hey, we want our girls back. And they're like, well, go ahead and start your show. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. You have all of our women in your house. So I like that story. <laughs> that's a good, that's a goodie. Now, uh, now what did you? What did you learn about your other hero, Lennon, for your book, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, which is Alice Cooper in Jesus? What did I learn? You know, I've studied the Beatles uh, since I was 10 years old. So that would have, I would, that started in 73. The Beatles hit America in 64. But um, what surprised me? Well, I, I guess I could say, um, um, you know, the, he was, he, he spoke about spirituality, um, which was interesting. I don't necessarily, at one point in time, he did become a born again Christian, but um, he was watching um, a show about Jesus in 1977, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, he became, uh, so he became a born again Christian for a very short time. And then uh, he got talked out of it and then went the other way and started getting into, he wasn't a worshiper of the occult, but um, it's, and it's well known that Yoko Ono used to buy Egyptian artifacts and uh, would consult psychics about her business investments. And they, they were, they were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good and solid investments. They would buy Egyptian mummies that would quadruple in value. So um, at one point in time, you know, he was worth a lot more than Paul McCartney. Um, uh, mm -hmm. She, she was really good. She, that when at the, let's see, at the end of his life, he was worth 200 million. And in, so he died in 1980, but in 75, he was worth 5 million. So that shows you how much she, she did for their estate. So uh, now they're, mm -hmm. they're close to probably a billion dollars. But now, what about Billy Graham? Because I remember years ago, I had a good friend who was a singing evangelist who went on tour with Billy Graham. And he said, which I thought was very fascinating, that the whole Billy Graham organization said, let's decide how we are going to run uh, our, well, I don't know if you call it an empire or their mission in a way that we would not create any scandal. Because he said, you would never have a man and woman who were married to each other traveling together. Not that anything would happen, but it's all perception has nothing to do with reality. So tell us some Billy Graham stories. Then Tony, if anyone is written in the chat who they wanna hear about, you can, uh, you can tell us. All right, Billy Graham. So what you were referring to was was an agreement that he made. What had happened was is there was a picture of him getting in a limousine in Atlanta. And then there was also another, well, the, the, the first picture was a picture of all the ushers holding bags of money. And then the other picture was of Billy Graham getting into a car. Um, and so 
it made it look like he was taking the money and running like uh, like Elmer Gantry is, is, is how he said it. So he did not want that perception out there. So what he decided to do was gather all of his men and they were going to pray uh, and then get together in the, in, the, in the next hour and put all these ideas into the pot and decide how they were going to remain scandal free. Um, and so some of those decisions were Billy would never enter a room with another woman. Um, yeah. And the guys would never be in a room alone with a woman on the road. They would always have to bring someone else. They would always have to be financially accountable. They'd have to have a board. Um, they wouldn't charge for crusades, but they would take donations so that everything was paid for. So uh, they, they safeguarded themselves. Um, and, and I think they're probably one of the few organizations that uh, remain scandal free for for many many years you know he was he was preaching for almost 60 years I always tell everybody the most impressive thing about Billy Graham was you know I go to several presidential libraries and um, they do a, a majority of their work in four to eight years and that's how the whole library is built well Billy Graham's in, the intensity of his work and the amount of work that he did was was the same as the United States pre president but he did it for 60 years um, so he was, he, I counted in 1973 when he was in his sixties, he did 32 crusades worldwide. Can you imagine, um, the pace of that and what that would take? Because I've, I've watched Greg Laurie put on crusades and the amount of work that goes just into one is, is, is astronomical. And then the pressure of course, um, uh, to put on that is also, he always, he always says he feels pressure and then, uh, and then he has to go away on vacation for for a few weeks just to unwind yeah now tell us about greg laurie because i know you've written quite a few books with him and have more coming up um yeah the the, the upcoming book that we're going to do is called um and by the way I'm, I'm looking at the chat i do have a kubrick story okay good <laughs> yeah it's getting right i have some really good kubrick stories <laughs> um okay so where were we? I lost track. Well, first of all, I asked you about oh, Greg Laurie. Then we can go to the chat yeah. and what Tony wants to tell us. Okay, so the next book is going to be called Fame, and it's going to focus on the subject of fame and that they recently took a poll and 50% of all young people, their ambition, their goal is not to be a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer. It's to be famous. So we examine why young people want to become famous, why they think it's the answer, um, and then we actually then go into the history of fame and uh, we go all the way back to the uh, uh, ancient uh, gla the gladiators. But the very first famous person, you'll love this, in the United States was George Washington. And I didn't realize this until I researched the book, but um, because he was uh, the new president and nobody had any concept of what this was, uh, people wanted to see him. So he, he had to set aside one day a week. Where he would, where people, anybody off the street could come in and see the president of the United States, and he would do a little meet and greet every week. I thought that was pretty funny and amusing. Wow. Um, so yeah, so we examine fame, what it's like. Uh, we we just we we get quotes from people who have had fame, and then pretty much they tell you what happens when once they get it, and then um, uh, what their lives are like. And uh, so some, sometimes, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of tragedy behind fame. Okay, let me go in my Kubrick story. I know this, right. I know this Kubrick story because I was going to do a book with a, a stuntman named Lauren James. And uh, Lauren was the um, stuntman on Spartacus. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, everybody on that, so Kirk, first of all, Kirk Douglas was the producer and he hired Kubrick. And Kubrick was, quote unquote, his boy. And Kubrick at the time was, I think, 31 years old. Um, he had done uh, one or two films prior, nothing of the scale of uh, Spartacus. And um, he was a very antisocial guy. He was a brilliant film director, but he didn't know how to talk to people. And so a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people on the film were um, were very seasoned actors, very seasoned behind the camera. And he just offended everybody. Uh, but he had this weird quirk where he would wear this um, black suit, white shirt, black tie, and he wore that every single day. And he didn't bathe. And so uh, after a while, he he started to stink. And so um, 
Kurt Russell, no, I'm sorry, uh, Kirk Douglas noticed that everybody on the set just did not respect him. And so um, he called a meeting and said, hey, did you, what's the deal? What's the deal with this director? Why don't you respect him? And then uh, Gene Simmons, the actor said, well, have you ever smelled the man, Kirk? And he said, no, I haven't. And she said, well, he hasn't taken a bath ever since he started filming this movie. And so, so Kirk racked up the meeting. And so he had to, he had to tell uh, uh, Kubrick that he needed to uh, take a shower and change his clothes. <laughs> that had to be a pretty tough conversation. <laughs> so the next day he shows up, he's taking a bath, but he's, he's wearing, the, he must've gotten the clothes dry clean because he's wearing the same clothes. He's wearing the black jacket, the black tie and the white shirt. So that's just one of many that I have of, of, uh, of Kubrick. Um, Very cool. We've got a question asking, was Steve McQueen really a steam sealer, especially around Yule Brenner, which caused discord on the set of Magnificent Seven? Yes. Yeah. At the time, um, this, this, this movie was filmed in 1960. <clears throat> Steve McQueen was trying to break out of Wanted Dead or Alive, the TV series. So he was, back then there was a, a big line of demarcation when it came to television and movies. You were a television star or a movie star. You didn't do both. So he was in television trying to make it big uh, on screen, on the silver screen. So um, when they did this film, Magnificent Seven, um, Steve was like the second lead and he tried everything he could to, to steal scenes from, from Yul Brynner. Um, for example, as they're riding up the stagecoach, you know, he's, uh, Yul Brenner's got a cigar in his mouth and a cowboy hat and, and McQueen's got these shotgun shells and he's shaking them up to his ear and he's looking at the rifle. But the best, the best scene uh, was when there was a part, Yul Brenner was a very, very small man. So was Steve McQueen. But um, there was a scene where McQueen walks back and forth like this and Yul Brenner's standing still on him. And, and he had, uh, built this mound of dirt that he could stand on. But when Steve McQueen was walking by like this, he'd kick a little bit of the dirt underneath Yule's feet so that he'd, you know, go back. He'd, he'd sink smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and then by the end of the film, I, you know, this was a Steve McQueen movie. And that's what that's what helped launch him to become a movie star. And by the way, since I'm mentioning Steve, I wanted to show you, this is my- uh, yes. That's okay. it. <laughs> yeah, that's my uh, McQueen. Uh, mug shot. Oh, there we go. There you go. That's that's good. when he was he was arrested in Alaska in 1972 in Anchorage, Alaska, for doing donuts. He was uh, testing a car, and he, you know he was drunk. And uh, anyway, he um, the cop came up to him and said, uh, <clears throat> or McQueen said, "Yeah, I'm Steve McQueen, and I'm I'm having fun in your two bit town." And the state trooper said, "Well." I'm the last escape state trooper and you're under arrest. <laughs> and then he was he was drunk because he's given the peace sign like this in that in that uh, mug yeah. shot. <laughs> you wanted to see some other stuff on my wall real quick. So let's see. All here. right. Good. Uh, this is my John Lennon. That's a Leroy Neiman signed John Lennon. I bought that like 20 years ago. Oops. That's him. Uh, yeah. There we go. Uh, those Wonderful. are the words to imagine. And then let's see here. And then I've got my my psychedelic Beatles. Oh yes. <laughs> and then of course you can't have the Beatles without having the Rolling Stones. Absolutely. Very nice. <laughs> so yeah, those are. Uh, you can tell I'm a I'm a classic rock guy. Well, good. Well, well, Tony, I noticed that my guest is here now. Oh, Anthony, Anthony is here now. This this photograph of you on this slide uh, where you have the tie on, is that a movie or a, an ad? What is it? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And I apologize for my lateness. First of all, I had some things with my girlfriend and the doctor uh, but uh, that we had to take care of. And But I want to thank you because I'm a big, a great admirer of your, your work, Patricia, and also what you do for so many people. And of course, it's great to be with Marshall as well. Um, and each of you, actually. So that picture is from a Disney movie called Pixel Perfect. 
and I play uh, the CEO of Harshtone, and I uh, steal. I try to steal a hologram from one of the uh, the makers, who was a young man at the time. And uh, I'm a I'm a bad guy in that film. So that was a good <laughs> movie. Well, a very good looking bad guy. And in as part of the introduction, I did tell them that you are the nephew of my boss that I frequently talk about, and you. What a year, two years ago, came out with JC Bring Cutting to the Truth, wonderful documentary uh, that is available on your streaming services. We highly recommend it. And I don't know, Anthony, if ever you'd like to come and talk to us about making the the uh, documentary on Jay. I would love to anytime. You Good. you say the, you give me the date and I'll be there. Okay, good. Now, as we have you both here, why don't you tell us how you got together and the process of you working together on the J book? Well, Marshall, you mind if I, uh, because Go for it. as I recall, well, I was doing a lot of research and it, it, it spanned about 20 some odd years and, and actually from a very early time in my childhood that I wanted to know everything about J. And so, um, you know, there was... I organized everything in, in a chapter. And of course, uh, one of the chapters was Jay and Steve McQueen's friendship. So I did research and I, uh, the uh, Neely McQueen and Chad McQueen weren't, inter they didn't, they, they didn't meet, they kind of declined to do any interviews. And I saw that Marshall Terrell was uh, an authority on Steve McQueen. And I reached out to him and he was very gracious. And uh, we spoke and, uh, Marshall actually had said, he said that he, because I wanted to interview him for the for the doc, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marshall, but you couldn't because you had an option with Jer, I think, was it a, a, an actor for a McQueen project? Right. But Marshall right. At, the, at the time did say, you know, I've always thought that Jay's story was as interesting, if not maybe even more so than Steve McQueen. And I, and I don't want to overspeak that. Um, if, if, is that how you recall it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Jay was, um, um, he helped shape the look of, of uh, today's modern man. And uh, of course, Anthony can speak more eloquently to that. But I love those hidden figures um, that uh, that we don't really know much about. But when this book comes out, and of course, when his, his documentary came out, um, it, it talks about how Jay uh, was the first um, American hairstylist designer that brought men out of the whole shaved buzz cut into you know dry hair design um styling and um and when of course when he was killed that legacy died with him and so the idea between behind the documentary and the book is to you know revive that and just say hey this is who this guy was here are all the amazing things he did um, and he, uh, you know, he should be up for some sort of reevaluation. Re well, I remember I picked up the phone one day and, and a voice said, this is Steve McQueen. <laughs> and I knew it really was. And he said, can Jay go racing with me tomorrow? So I had to call all Jay's appointment. Sorry, Mr. Sebring's been called out to town on business. Can we reschedule? And I don't think you were here, but in the introduction, I told them about how Jay kissed me on the cheek and gave the mug to Frankie who had had Mr. Sebring gold leaf and stand, sandblast in and said, look after this till I come back Monday. Well, this is in my trust that you get the mug when I die. <laughs> Good. All right. Are there any other questions about stories our audience wants to hear about, Tony? Uh, yes, uh, Richard Sachs asked about Martin Luther King. I've written about him um, for Arizona State University. And as a matter of fact, I just wrote one, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I did a and a with a professor. The, uh, you know, when he gave his very famous, I, I have a dream speech, he had given that a handful of times before. Yeah, he did. Um, and he was going to give a fresh speech for the March on Washington in 63. And almost like in midstream, um, Amelia, Amelia Jackson uh, looks over at him 
and says, Martin, tell them about your dream. And if you if you freeze frame it and you watch her, you can you can see that happening. And then he immediately transitions to that speech, and then it becomes this classic speech. But it was not he that was not the speech that he was going to give that day. And we had a speaker oh a, a few weeks ago who who was an expert in communications and speaking, and he analyzed that speech, and it was a fascinating program. Good. Any other questions from our audience, Tony? Yeah, we have one from uh, someone, Susan, uh, asking the difficult singer with having a famous daughter, Billy Ray Cyrus. Um, <laughs> really sad, but I know you can't answer that question. So mm, that's a good guess. No, but let's remember, Marshall said, take that job and shove it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so <laughs> now. Now, this might be of interest, especially as we have two documentary filmmakers here, but uh, uh, Marshall, you have executive produced two documentaries, Steve McQueen and Johnny Cash. And in 2022, you formed your own documentary film company. So what is it about that format that excites you? And I don't know, because uh, as, as, uh, certainly, as Anthony has had a similar experience, maybe we'll hear from you first, and then a comment from Anthony. Okay. I, there's when when, um, when I was asked to start executive producing documentaries, there was just there's something more inherently uh, exciting when you, uh, as opposed to I'm in my office and I'm writing a book and I'm you know doing research, whereas you know film set. There's a camera there, there's lights, there's people working behind the scenes. And it's just exciting. It, and it's the, the interesting thing is to me, a documentary is nothing but a book in film form. That's all it is. And so it's just a different way of doing something. Um, but I've noticed that the younger generation now, and I'm a big documentary fan, but the younger generation doesn't necessarily read books anymore. So they and I, and I do this too. I, I listen to my books on Audible and audio. Um, I'm at that age now where if I start reading I, after ten minutes, I fall asleep. So um, <laughs> it's just it's just a different way to consume something and sell something. And I tell everybody, when you write a book, it, it, it then becomes a property, and the property now can be a documentary, it can be a podcast, it can be a feature film, um, and that's what Anthony and I are hoping to do with this uh, Jay Sebring book. You know, it, it is a property one because uh, we're hoping that uh, people will read it and just say, yeah, we could, we could, we can slice this up in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. I'll Craig, let Anthony talk. Yeah, Craig asked, uh, to, Jay Sebring was more than just a talented stylist and businessman. Why was his personality so powerful? I'll let Anthony answer that. Um, well, and, and, and so that, I guess that's two parts, and, and I wanted to go into the documentary, uh, our, our fascination and our passion for them. Initially, I was going to tell Jay's story in a screenplay, and I was interviewing amazing people and getting, and I had the story, but I realized that one of the challenges was, and each documentary is its own beast, and, and Marshall and I are aware of that even in, in the process of this book. Um, what's most important is to collaborate with people who share and have a regard for the story. And that's what we have, thankfully. And, and hopefully you have people who are talented, which he is. And with Jay's story, there was a challenge because I didn't want, I mean, the people that Jay influenced, he was like the nucleus of an atom in which the electrons are Steve McQueen, Frank Sinatra, the Rat Pack, Henry Fonda, Bruce Lee, Jim Morrison. And, the point of the film is to restore the face to a culturally historically relevant figure whose legacy and and identity was stolen from him in the aftermath of his own slaughter the sensationalism and i didn't want people to be distracted with is that supposed to be frank sinatra he doesn't look like paul newman that's not the rat pack you know oh she doesn't and i realized with the with the footage that i have of jay and from our family archives the best face to restore jay's face was his own. And so that's what that's when things changed to become the documentary. I'm sorry, what was the second the question? Um, oh, with Jay's personality. Yeah. Why was, why was his personality so powerful? Yeah. 
You know, I asked Quincy Jones, uh, one of the things that people said, Joe Tornueva, Jay's protege, uh, Quincy Jones, Dennis Hopper. I mean, these were people, these are people who are cool in their own sense. But one of the things they all said was he was just cool. Mm -hmm. And I said to Quincy, I said, how, how was he cool? And he said, I don't know, man. You know, when you're cool, you have it or you don't. And he had it. And, and, and that's one of those things that, and, and I think that with Jay's personality and charisma, that was not only his talents, but that was one of the things that, as Nancy Sinatra said, made him a magnet. And I think that that personality, and along with his integrity, because as Marshall and I have been discussing, his Midwestern roots really was something special and very valuable for the iconic stars that they could trust him. And so his personality was dynamic. He had the charisma, but he also had that integrity that not only stars and, and some of the biggest male stars, but also women found very attractive. Good. All right. Are there any more questions, Tony and Craig, for, for Marshall? I don't see any more questions in the chat. So. Hey, Patricia, oh, if you recall, yes. I was going to read to you the prologue of our book. Yes, why not? Would that? I think everyone would love that. Why not? Yeah, we want to give you guys a taste of this. Right. And if there's any bad language, just remember that Anthony wrote that part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to start this off like Jay would. This is about you. His story is about you because you look the way you do because of Jay. This section is for male readers, obviously. Before Jay, men went to a barbershop and pointed to a poster on a wall. It had photos of usually nine haircuts. Almost were all a variation of the flat top. There was the butch, the flat top boogie, the forward comb boogie, the crew, and the Hollywood. There were also three versions of the contour. They were the college, the executive, and the professional. Those were your options. The barber wore a white coat and short sleeves, usually betraying a tattoo. Forget tribals and inspirational quotes. This guy had an anchor, a mermaid, or a hula dancer. My grandfather had a, a, had a hula dancer and he'd make it dance for me. Um, there were ashtrays, lots of them, and side tables stacked with magazines, auto hunting, true crime, plus a few playboys. If you were under 15 and dared to sneak a peek, you could expect to hear, those aren't for you, son, from the barber. He shaved your neck with hot foam and a straight razor. Then, then he dabbed on potions with jockey or prince in the name until you smelled like him and you looked like shit. Every guy did because every guy got one haircut, a variation of the same haircut. That's where Jay came along. He made you the best looking version of you. Before Jim Morrison was Jim Morrison, Electra sent him to Jay's salon sometime in late 66. What can I do for you, Jay asked. I want to look like this, Morrison said. He pulled out a picture of a mosaic, statue, or painting of Alexander the Great. The iconic image of Jim Morrison that is plastered on t-shirts and posters to this day is what Jay created. Jay Sebring was the first superstar hairstylist, though he often corrected people and referred to himself as a, quote, hair designer. He was Vidal Sassoon before Vidal Sassoon. He was Jean Chacove before Jean Chacove. In the 1960s, he charged the equivalent of $1,000 in today's money. He introduced concepts like privacy and exclusivity, which salons, restaurants, and nightclubs embrace today. His client list read like the essential Hollywood power structure, circa 1965. Steve McQueen once demanded that Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studio fly in Jay for an, an on location cut in New Orleans, but it was really an opportunity for them to hang out, smoke pot, and chase women. Jay flew in, the studio keeping its star happy at $2,500 per day for the stylist services. He jetted in on our Friday, partied with McQueen for two days, cut his salon on the third, cut his hair on the third, and a few hours later was back at his trendy Fairfax salon tending to his Hollywood client, clientele of icons, movie stars, A-listers, moguls, titans of industry, entertainment executives, and power players who queued in line for hours to experience Jay's magic. Everyone loved Jay, everyone. As a biographer, you look for something, anything that belies humanity. Almost all famous people you read about had regrettable moments in their life when they threw a drink in someone's face, lost their temper, 
and a room full of people or walked away from a car accident. Jay was almost too good to be true. He left behind nothing his mother would be embarrassed to hear. This is a story of an American entrepreneur who left his mo modest Midwestern home in a car that had to be push started and went to seek his fortune in Southern California, a place that often doesn't get credit for the profound cultural ch changes happening there at the time. The old Hollywood ruled by, ruled by the studios with its carefully curated stars and pearlescent publicity photos was giving way to a grittier, more rebellious aesthetic. Music, architecture, movies, art, graphic design, cuisine, and fashion were all being remade in Southern California. While San Francisco gets credit to this day for dominating 1960s popular culture, anyone who was there, who, who became someone later on, eventually went to LA. In Los Angeles at this time, there was no six degrees of separation. It was more like two. That was pal There was a palpable, palpable intimacy in LA's 30 mile zone. Common dreams were stoked up by the vibe of the times of those cool sounding street names, Hollywood Boulevard, the Sunset Strip, Santa Monica Boulevard, Melrose Avenue, Rodeo Drive, La Cienega, and the ones that ran through the canyons, Laurel, Benedict, and Topanga. It's where Neil Young and Bruce Palmer and Richie Ferre and Stephen Steele's spotted each other going the opposite way one afternoon on Sunset Boulevard. Young was hard to miss. He was driving a 53 Pontiac, Pontiac hearse with Palmer riding shotgun. They pulled a U-turn, stopped their cars, greeted each other, and created Buffalo Springfield on the stop. It was the same roadway where Steve McQueen would cruise in one of his high-end sports cars and troll for young women and hitchhikers. His pickup line was crude, crude and effective. Get in, shut the door. You know who I am, right? I don't like to talk. You can see me in the movies. But if you're up for a little fun and games. In Hidden Valley, in Hidden Hills, at a record producer's private retreat, Janis Joplin cracked Jim Morrison over the head with a bottle of Southern Comfort to fend off his sloppy and advanced and his drunken advances. It had the opposite effect. It turned him on, and he begged for her phone number. In Laurel Canyon, David Crosby and Joni Mitchell performed acoustic sets in living rooms together while appreciative guests swayed their heads, sipped on wine, and passed the roach around. In Beverly Hills, Brian Wilson composed the Beach Boys' next wave of classic songs on a piano, sitting in a bed of sand because he liked to wiggle his toes in it while he was working. Meanwhile, the scene in his brother's Pacific Palisades mansion was a, cra was a crowd of freeloading hippies and drifters, including a creepy ex-con trying to wheedle his way into the music business with a load of hipster patter and unwashed nymphs. LA in the 60s was a place where things like this happened all the time. Yeah. Two degrees of separation. All those elements and lives intersect here and nothing would ever be the same. Wow. <clears throat> Great, wonderful, perfect. Very, very exciting. That is a great opening uh, for a book that we can ear read or read. And then we look forward to whatever happens documentary wise after. Okay. Now of all the, all the books that you've written, all the people you've collaborated with, is there one project, Marshall, that you look forward to perhaps putting together? Well, I always tell everybody each book is like a child. So um, it's hard to say what is your favorite. Um, what I'm enjoying about this book with Anthony is that I have no, usually I map out a book, what I'm going to do. This book is kind of like what I call like a jazz book. And we've, we've talked about Jay's love for jazz. We're improv and we're, we're just going with our gut. And we're, Anthony and I will discuss how we'll do each chapter. We'll talk about it, get some ideas, and then I'll get on the phone with my developmental editor and we'll put something together that just flows so nicely and is unexpected and you know the day before I didn't think that we would have this and then the next day we've got something and then from there it inspires me to write something and um and then of course collaborating with Anthony has been a lot of fun because um I, I I've been telling everybody it's when we get together it's like the three stooges we're 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 90 <laughs> percent I think having fun and 10 percent serious 
Um, but it, that, it's been a fun book because it's just been so unexpected what we're going to write. But I'll let you give his perspective of it because I think it'd be, I've never heard, we've never really discussed this before. All right. Well, Anthony, now you you have had a very creative life with your different projects. You have never written a book yourself, have you? Um, I did do a book. Uh, it's called Bruce Lee, The Jay Sebring Connection. And that was with uh, oh. Bruce Lee historians, uh, uh, David Tadman and Steve Carriage. And that's more like a cocktail, you know, a coffee table. Uh, it's a very pictorial and it's so this, what we're doing together, Marshall and I, is an epic biography. It's it's really detailed, and uh, the process working with Marshall is great. And and being like as you bring up Patricia about when I got into acting, I realized how important it was regard for craft. And for an actor, they're not only collaborating with the director and the other actors, but the script. And in one of the processes that I work is to really understand whether it's a film a tv show whether it's stage what is this about what is my character as it relates now sometimes if you're doing a csi and you're a bad guy you're just you're just a bad guy you don't have to get too deep into it and with marshall and i what we've been doing we have that same regard for story and so anytime we bounce ideas off of each other we're both solid in what we know uh, with our own visions, because we know that this is Jay's story and what is relevant to Jay's story. So sometimes he might say, no, nah, I don't think that works because of this. And I'll go, oh, you know what? That's a great point. And then let's, we'll move on and vice versa. That's So that's been one of the great things. And by the way, Marshall, um, when we, we are working in the room in the office together, I do often have to walk by, back and forth and kick the sand under his feet. Um, <laughs> 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 and then... And then he wiggles his toes in the sand, you know, and then, <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, it, it, the process is very inspiring. And when Marshall says something, or sometimes he'll say, I'm going to write the intro to this and then, you know, go ahead and add whatever you want. And everything is so inspiring that I think I drive Maria nuts because I, I don't want to stop working on this. You know what I'm saying? So whether it be, I'm doing something else, whatever. It's very addictive. Uh, there have been a couple of questions or comments in the chat. I believe uh, Marshall put one that, uh, Anthony, you were in a Woody Allen movie. Oh, yes. Um, I did a ton of theater in New York. And one of my the actors that we worked together became a casting director. And she called me and asked me if I would put myself on film for a Woody Allen film. And, and I said, of course. And I did and was hired. And that was called Cafe Society that was set in the oh. 40s. Yes. And you have just excited my good pal, Susan Rowan, <laughs> who is also just, um, Marshall, I don't know if you were here when we were talking about Susan has just been honored as a legend in publishing. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, good. Right. Well, I, I do have to say it, it's it's interesting because working on some shows, and, and I don't mean to, you know, but they're like David Milch and Woody Allen are supreme intellects. And they also know how to direct. They know how to speak with an actor to elicit or ignite very organic, uh, uh, true behavior. And one of the things that was interesting about Woody is it was very daunting because Victorio Storaro, who's won three Oscars, I think two or three himself, you know, he did Apocalypse Now, the cinematographer. So Woody comes out and he says, uh, you know, keep in mind it's the 30s and um, stick to the script, but feel free to ad lib. And then he walked <laughs> off. And some people might think that that's a contradiction, but it's not. You stick to what the word, Woody's words, but then through behavior, you actually can improvise or what have you. And, and, and that's then when Woody said that, I asked for uh, props and certainly asked for a drink and maybe some grapes because then I could, <laughs> Parker Posey, by the way, was phenomenal. And, but, and so was Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, Bruce Willis, this might be a little fact that some pe many people don't know. He originally played the part that Steve Carell played and I'm not sure what had happened or transpired. And I, I enjoyed working with Bruce and everybody in the cast. 
but it so it, it happened that Steve Carell, uh, six months later, we we reshot some of all all three of those scenes. But it was a pleasure working with every one of them. Uh, I think Susan Rowan just put her hand up. Uh, um, first of all, I'm so glad you are both in the documentary business because to me those are my favorite movies. When I watched the RBG documentary by Julia Cohn five times, phenomenal. And then I went and watched the movie out of Hollywood and I go, they tried to put in a scene that he was, Marty was gonna divorce her because it would be more Hollywoodish. And her, the nephew who wrote it said no. So thank you, I love documentaries. But the question I would ask you is, I have noticed that CNN, HBO and MSNBC are underwriting and doing documentaries. Would that be a, a, a way for you to do it or is that not in your future? I'll answer real quick. Um, I, what, what, what I'm, gonna, I'm taking the same approach as I do with books. I, I produce it, I get it ready, I get it fully edited and then I sell it. Um, so whoever is going to buy, that's who I'm gonna go with. So it's possible that any one of those could um, could buy it. I love H HBO to me is the gold standard when it comes to anything. Um, their documentaries are second to none. So um, we'll, we, I have an agent already who's going to try and sell it, but um, it just all depends who's going to buy. But uh, right. I'm just, uh, what I want to do is try to re retain control as much as I can um, because then um, once I give it to them, there's very little they can do. It's the same with a book. Like there's very little editing or changing that they could do. When I did uh, my book, uh, one of the gentlemen mentioned that he read it called Steve McQueen, uh, The Life and Legend of a Hollywood Icon. They they originally wanted uh, a 300 page book. Well, there's no way you can do McQueen's book, book biography in 300 pages. I turned it in, the second one that I did was 610 pages and there was nothing that they could do about it. They just, and and they just charged a little bit more. They just charged a little bit extra. But, you know, there was no way that I was going to turn in an abbreviated biography of of uh, somebody that I'm the most knowledgeable person in the world about. So, and by the way, Patricia, I've done seven books on McQueen. Seven? <laughs> I beg seven. your pardon. Yeah. My gosh. <laughs> now, t President Tony has to leave. It is 8.55. So we have four more minutes. Uh, Craig, are there any comments in the chat that... Alan Garber asked about Pistol Pete Maravich, and as a native Atlantan uh, who watched Pistol Pete as a child, I'm going to listen to the recording for your answer on that question, but uh, y'all have a great day. All right, thank you, Tony. Question? Pistol Pete, uh, Craig, can you read that question in the chat? Is oh, Craig still Pistol with Pete. I, I, I'm still here. Um, okay. Pistol Pete. I'll have to find that um, while I'm looking yeah, for that. It says, do you have any Pistol Pete stories? Yeah, okay. Got tons. Um, well, pick your favorite. <laughs> um, you know, it's tough. Uh, there's, I'll say this, he's relevant right now because there's a young man that is threatening his scoring record. Um, now, Pistol Pete, his scoring he record. In, he was th three, three points short at yeah, the end of the but, season. But this, this, this kid today, Pistol Pete, did his and he was it was freshman and eligible so he only had three years to do his the, this this new kid has had five to break it um in pistol pizza era, there was no three-point line there is a three-point line um and uh so again this this kid's had five seasons to try and break it now what they're where they're, they're debating is to send him to a tournament um and they would this they would have to pay to put him in a tournament so it's getting very convoluted and so people are asking me what do you think and i just well it's it's really an apples to oranges comparison it's it's you know pistol pete is still the greatest of all time but um you know records were made to be broken but it should be on the same level there there shouldn't be an asterisk all right marshall uh you have i as we have a guest who seems is great we have a co-presenter in the last two minutes, would you both have a concluding remark? Anthony first, and we'll give the the final uh, comments to you, Marshall. Uh, 
Oh, okay. There you go. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a tough question. It's a great question, but uh, I appreciate being here with and just speaking with all of you and, and your passion for storytelling. And, and I think that that's a great endeavor that each of us in our own way, whether it be as a, a interest in them or creating them, that we tell real stories that are uh, inspiring uh, and yet uh, very human. And uh, that's it for now. But Marshall? <laughs> Well, to me, the most important thing are applying the old school journalistic ethics today. We've we've got uh, uh, I'm not fond of journalism that, that I see going on. And I I try to be as fair as possible. I try to be as accurate as possible. I try not to have an opinion. Um, I try to let the friends, um, for example, uh, you know, in the narrative, you can get you can guide a little bit. But the best thing to do is allow the friends to, to fill in those parts. Steve McQueen had this thing about acting where um, you don't say anything, you, you let your character actors fill in the, the parts and then when you have something important to say, then you say it. I've kind of adopted the same attitude towards books. Like I'm really not gonna say anything about the subject unless it's really important that I got a hammer home, but I, I try to stay as objective as possible. And when you're, when you're fair and you're balanced and you're accurate, Nobody, nobody can come back at you and say, well, you know, you did a really bad job on that. Do you mind if I uh, dovetail on Marshall's comment there? Sure. Because, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, I, I'm so sorry I didn't get in sooner. But Marshall's point is a very astute one in that um, with the documentary, you know, there's the Ken Burns style of documentarian approach where, you know, the Civil War began on this date. And we have a narrator that tells us. And, and that's very effective for that particular type of documentary. And so what I did, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to have a narrator or be a narrator, I, I didn't really, but as I started to work on it and speak with people, and this is what Marshall brought up in his approach to writing books and what we are including in, in ours, is that I wanted, there's that saying, uh, show, don't tell. Don't tell people what happened. You know reveal it just let it unfold and people it has more credibility so what i did in the documentary for jay was i organized all my questions by theme and or chapter and what was amazing is how many people would start to tell a story and they all would tell the same story and i allowed i i didn't have a narrator tell us what happened it were it was the family friends uh colleagues maybe you know some uh and adversaries of Jay's, they told the story. And that's where the editing, whether it be in the book or the documentary is so crucial in the shaping of that, that, that story. But that, it, I think it's a much more, uh, it has more, uh, Marshall, what's the word? Uh, credibility. Credibility, mm -hmm. thank you. And that's, that's something that the people who were there are telling us what happened. And when they're able to complete each other's story, that then we know it, it it really did happen that way well gentlemen thank you on behalf of the members of the golden gate breakfast club we appreciate your time your information your passion for delivering a fabulous program for my fellow members much though it's nice to get together in person the value of Zoom meetings is we can bring in speakers and friends we would never otherwise have the opportunity to present to us. We look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. And can we please have a hand for Anthony and Marshall? And yay, yay, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Marshall, come back next year and talk about any other books. And you've got so much coming out. And Anthony, you and I'll talk about delivering a program. My friend Derek Arden has a chat show in England. He is waving. And so do not be surprised if you get an, an invitation to speak for him. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I have a, a meeting at nine o'clock which i'm a little late for and they can wait because when Anthony and marshall speak paid customers can wait thank you gentlemen uh -huh. thank you pals goodbye 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 thank you <laughs>